Well, Psalm 119, tonight we're going to try to cover verses 33 through 40. Uh, the title I wrote to this and um, wrote about this tonight is the definition of a believer in four words. And you'll see that so clearly in just a minute. Again, we started this a while back, as y'all know. Uh, Psalm 119 is not just the longest chapter that we see in all of the Psalms. It's the longest in the whole Bible. 2,445 words. That's amazing. 176 verses. I didn't know until we studied it this way. It's broken down into 22 different stanzas. Most of you know that most of the songs were actually music that would be sung. There's 22 stanzas. And when you look at your Bible, you'll find out what I overlooked all these years is each one of those stanzas is exactly eight verses long. Only God could do something like that, right? And so we're taking them eight verses at a time because I found out when I studied the first eight verses, there's no way in the world I could do two of those in one night without making you guys ready to go home. And so... That's where we are, and again, we're just a few weeks into this, but we'll get through it, I promise, if you'll just buckle your seatbelts. We don't know who the author of Psalm 119 was. Many of the songs we don't. I've taught you, I think it's about 53% of the songs we believe can be credited to David. The rest, there's a hodgepodge of different people, and the bulk of those others, we just don't know with great certainty. There are a lot of guesses that are given to us. Not a whole lot of guesses here. All I can tell you is this. We know a lot about who this person was because of the what he wrote about. Most likely a person who had been treated very unfairly by people, harshly by people, and probably had every reason and every um, excuse to give up on their faith, but they chose not to. And ultimately, in a nutshell, to remind you, what this really tells us, Psalm 119, is what happens when a person chooses to put God's word as their sole source in life. I decided a long time ago, I don't know if you guys have, I've already decided a long time ago, the only source I have that is life and completely trustworthy for me is God's Word. And that's why I read it every day of my life. I don't even know how many times I've read through the Bible, but I'm not going to stop till the day that I die. And at least once a year I go through the Bible. And so I want, I want to encourage you to do that as well. Make it your sole source. When I start thinking about how I could be a better parent, I have the Bible. When I want to know I can be a better pastor, I have the Bible. When I, not, I want to learn how I can be a better friend to you or a better person in this world, it's all right here. Everything you need as your source in life is in God's Word. This person who we don't know who it is had been treated harshly, had every reason to say, I just don't give up on this faith, but they pressed in instead and learned that God's Word was completely trustworthy. That why, that's why it is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. And so tonight, we, I, you know, every time I study these, I just try to have an open heart. And I think God really gave me, there's four different descriptions here of what a Christian will look like. We can walk away tonight and have a way to evaluate who we are and where we are in our faith just by this uh, little eight verses of Scripture. So let's dive into the text I gave you tonight, this little outline. The first term that I found here is that the believer is a student. And I, I, can, I think I can even say this way, the believer ought to be a student. Um, no one should know more about the Word of God in the church than you. You should be a student of the Word of God. You want to know all you can know about the Word of God. I hope that you'll always be an eternal student when it comes to the things of God. He says this in the first two verses. It says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. The word teach, there's the word yara. It literally means to pour it's to lay the foundation, it's to establish, or even in some cases to irrigate, which is a really interesting term that it could be that. Most men in this room are probably a lot like me. We, we don't like to stop and ask directions. I don't know how many times in my life that Tracy, she's not shouted at me many times in 36 years of marriage, but I remember distinctly a time when I was a knucklehead and I didn't know where I was in Louisiana, I'm wearing seminary, and she's like, would you please stop and ask directions? Our ego just can't do that, right? Praise God for all the GPSs and all that stuff. But y'all remember, there, this we're talking about late in the middle 1980s. None of that stuff existed back then. We had road maps. Y'all remember those road maps? Mm -hmm. We didn't have map quests back then. We had road mm -hmm. maps to do that. And I was just a knucklehead. I said, you know, just I bet it's right around this corner. And then I bet it's right around this corner. And then finally she's like, if you don't stop. And so men are not really good to do that. But when you really think about it, the author of this psalm is basically saying, God, I need you to help me. You need to give me some direction. I don't know where I'm doing, and I need you to help me. So he says, God, would you teach me? What a great prayer. 
What a great prayer. Maybe we should start every day of our life with that, that start. God, teach me today. Teach me something new and fresh today. He says, teach me. And so, again, Yara, pour, lay the foundation, help establish in my life. Probably nothing in his life was that way. Then he says this, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it. The word observe is shamar in Hebrew. It means to keep, to guard, to build a hedge around. Think about that. God, I need you to teach me. At the same time, I need you to protect me. I need you to keep me, guard me, build a hedge around my life. Um, you know what we do with things that are of great value? We protect them, don't we? I mean, if, I had a, if, if money grew on trees right now, I'd give anything in the world if I could build a garage at my house. I have a garage, but it's so full of the stuff that we can't really use it for a garage. I wish I had a garage like you have, my brother, where I could put my boat in there in the winter and not have to worry about it, that kind of stuff. Maybe one day I'll get to do that. But when we have things that are of value, we protect them, don't, don't we? My wife is not a thingsy person at all. I can't think of hardly any time in the years we've known each other, she said, I'd really like to have X, Y, Z. But she really likes jewelry a lot. Yeah. And we raised three girls, poor old boys that came along courting my girls, because she's like, let me give you some advice on the kind of ring to marry, marry my daughter. You know, they've had to buy these gigantic, you know, rings for them. And, and Tracy has some very nice jewelry. I've bought a lot of it. But, you know, she has a jewelry box at our house. It's a really nice, one of the nicest pieces of furniture we have. And she wants to put those things in there to protect those things. Any good man in this room, if you have a gun in your home, you put it somewhere where your grandkids can't get to it. You put it in a place of safety where you know that it is. Think of the things in your life that really matter to you. We have a safe at our house. It's not a really especially nice one, but if a house caught on fire, it might keep things from burning up a little bit. And in there we have like insurance papers and, and some important warranties and things like that because we want to protect those things, right? If it's something that really matters to you, try to protect it. Here is the author of this Psalm saying, God, I need you to teach me some things. I want you to protect those things in my life. He goes on to say this, listen to this, understanding. He goes on to say, teach me, O, o Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all of my heart. That word understanding is the word being. It literally means this, to discern, to perceive, to heed. And it does not really talk about the quantity of, of understanding, but the quality of understanding. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul, right? What shall it profit a man if he knows all the facts and figures about everything, but he doesn't have the wisdom to do anything with it? He's not asking, God, teach me everything there is to know. He's teach, teach me what's important to know. And that's what the Word of God is. There's not a wasted word here. It's never going to lead you astray. It's going to teach you the things that you actually need to know. So he said, I want to understand the things that really do matter in life. And it's interesting to he, he points out what I would have said if it wasn't even there. He's not talking about head knowledge. He's talking about heart knowledge. You know, it's not head knowledge that saves a person. The Bible says that the demons believe. The demons know that Jesus is Lord, but they're not saved. It's heart, it's heart knowledge that saves, right? Look what he says in, again in verse 34. He says, give me understanding that I may observe your law. Observe, again, is the idea of keep, to guard, to build a hedge around. Observe it, and again he says, your law to keep it with all my heart. Oh, it's what you know in your heart that matters. My mother told me that in 1974 is when I got saved. That's a long time ago, I know. It's, that's dating me a, a good bit. But on the way home from church on a Sunday morning, she said when she was debriefing me to make sure I was paying attention at church, she said the way I answered her questions, she said I could, she literally said this, you did not answer from your head, you answered from your heart, yeah. right? Wow. So it's heart knowledge that saves. He says, I want to know this not just in my head. I want to know this in my heart. And the things that really matter in life are the things you need to store and treasure in your heart. The word viscera is the word I think we see uh, often uh, given to speak of this idea. It's a Latin word, viscera, that means the inward parts of man. It really is all that you are physically. Then the second term, we're not just to be students. Uh, the believer is also a soldier. We should be a soldier. He goes on to say this in verses 35 and 36. It says, make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and do not dishonor it. Or dis, 
do not, excuse me, and not to dishonor game. So a soldier needs a couple of things. I've never had the privilege to be a soldier. I took Air Force ROTC all three years I was in high school. I learned a little bit about the discipline involved. And I would have loved to have been in the military. I didn't grow up in an age where there was a draft or anything like that, but I would have probably enjoyed that life. I kind of like discipline anyway. But a soldier needs some discipline for sure in life. And I've got plenty of friends that I grew up with that did go in and told me the stories of what basic training was like and what it was like in the day-to-day -day life that they have. I did find out this, when your commanding officer tells you to do something, it's not open for debate. Right. You know, with me? <laughs> it's not a suggestion like your mother would make. You better do it, right? And so, interesting, he starts off verse 35, make me walk. I never went through basic training, but I bet there are a few guys walked and they thought they knew more than the, the CO or whoever's in charge, and, and maybe they th thought those things were suggestions and found out really quick they weren't suggestions. Maybe they had to do an extra push-up or two or run a few extra miles because of their lack of discipline. Make, he says, make me do this. It's interesting. Um, you know, we don't have to ask people or make people do things they really enjoy doing. No one's ever had to make me eat some ice cream. Have you ever been forced to do that? Mm -hmm. Phil, please, eat the ice cream. No, that's not, you know, right? No problem. Uh, Rick made this incredible cake for our thing the other night, and at the end he's like, Phil, would you take the rest of this home? I'm like, you know, I really didn't have to pray about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, you, if you're going to make me do it, right, because everything that man makes is amazing. It melts in your mouth, right? And so the point, no one has to make me eat one of the cakes that he makes. In fact, I usually, if there's a gathering, I walk over and say, which one's yours? And it's usually in that same cake thing he brings to my house that I always bring back and say, please, can I have another? So no one ever had to make me do that, right? But you know what? In raising kids, sometimes you have to make them clean up their room. Or if they took piano lessons, make them practice the piano, right? Or practice the guitar or do their chores or whatever it may be. It's an interesting place to get spiritually in life when you really are willing to say, God, make me do this. I know it's what's best for me. Make me do it. Can I tell you guys, I'm only 61. But in, in the years that I have followed Christ, which is, I can't believe it's been that many years, for 50 years I've known the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. There are things that he had to make me do, me inviting him to do so. If you can see the journals where I've written out to God, God, help me do this. God, help me do You know, I have this one statement that I made to God a long time ago when I felt his call my life. God, I give you my life. Whatever I could ever be, I'll never give you up. And I signed and I dated it. I meant that. And over the years, as many times I've asked God, please hold me in this place. Direct me in this path, whatever. God, make me do what's right. And what's happened is because that discipline has set in in my life, those are not even hard things for me anymore, or maybe they were at one time. And so a soldier needs discipline. If I didn't give you that already, verse 35, we need discipline. Honestly, we do. And so if we're honest with ourselves in this room, I think all of you would be honest to say, I need that discipline in my life. I talk to God about stuff like that every day of my life. God, I literally go through the routine of talking to him on my way to work every day. God, guard my heart. Guard my mind, guard my eyes, guard my hands, guard what I hear, guard what I say. Those things really do matter because I want to be a person of discipline. And I know I've got a long ways to go. I know that I do. So a soldier needs discipline, right? Number two, a soldier needs desire. A soldier needs desire. And we certainly would want someone that's serving us in the military that love what they do. Someone said to me the other day, Phil, you've been doing that preaching thing for a long time, haven't you? I said, yeah, 36 years. And I said, I love it as much today as I did the first day. The day that goes away is the day I'll get out of the way and let somebody else do it. Or y'all may invite me to do that before. But I love the, the adventure of what I get to do. I love it. And so he says in verse 36, incline my heart to your testimony." and not to dishonest gain. Wow. And so here's the psalmist asking God to fill his heart with the desire for the word of God instead of the ways of this world. And we are seeing in this, anyone can be a double-minded man. We see that in this world today. We're seeing that God can stand in the pulpit for year after year after year and preach the gospel, and yet behind the scenes when no one's looking, live a lifestyle that is not that, that they display before the world, that we all can be those kinds of things. And God says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, and ultimately that sin will be discovered. 
And so in this case, again, he says, I want you to incline my heart to your testimonies. What is his testimony? That's his word. Make me long for that and not for the things of this world. Now, I know you guys are so much better than I am, and y'all don't struggle with the things I do, but sometimes I catch myself, I really like some of the stuff in this world, not just food. I like cars and, and things like that, too, and I can, I can spend hour after hour wishing I could have this on eBay or wishing I could have that on Marketplace, whatever it may be, and waste my life away. Sometimes I have to talk to God about that. God, don't, don't let me love this world so much. And we all do. We really do. And so, God, direct my attention to your word. May I long for that. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you sat for hours on your Bi reading your Bible instead of flipping through your phone? I catch myself all the time. I used to make fun of Tracy because I didn't know what Facebook was. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and she's over there, can't sleep, and she's doing this thing. Now we're next to each other in bed sometimes <laughs> doing this. You know, it's like, what a waste. Well, I loved what Caleb Miller tried to do one of the nights at camp this year. He, he took up everybody's phone. I said, you know what? I think you should on Wednesday nights just have a basket. Put your phone mm -hmm. here. You can get it when we're finished. Because kids today, that's their best friend. I mean, it really is. It's their best friend. And so think about this. How much do we love this world as compared to love the Word of God? If I, if I have my eyes fixed on Jesus, it can't be fixed on some other things in my life that they don't need to be fixed on, right? And so one of the worst mistakes we could ever make is taking our eyes off him and putting one of the others. He says this in the, in the beginning of this. He says, turn away my eyes from looking at vanity. The word turn away, there's the word a bar in, in Hebrew. It means to pass over, to go beyond, to look the other way. Um, I remember years ago uh, taking a, a Bible study in this very room with some men on a Saturday morning, and we talked about having bouncing eyes. I remember that. Um, there's, there's nothing at all wrong with if you're walking through the local mall and you see a beautiful woman and say, that's a beautiful woman. That's not the problem. The problem is when you take the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth look, right? Bouncing eyes. There's nothing wrong with saying, what a beautiful person, and move on with your life. And I, I may have told you this story before, but I remember when, when Bethany was just a little bitty baby. And Tracy, you know, I, I knew better. Like every Friday, I would try to take Fridays off if I could. And I would just tell you, I'd call it Tracy Day. What's Tracy want to do today? You know, I know she was at home taking care of that baby every day. I know that was a lot and, and also helping me do the things at the church. And so I remember one day she said, well, let's go to Atlanta. We, we lived in McKaysville, Georgia then. It was about an hour and a half drive to go to Atlanta to go to the closest mall to us because we didn't have anything like that in McKaysville, Georgia. We didn't even have a Dollar General store in McKaysville, Georgia. And so we're at the local mall, and I knew. She goes, um, I want to go look at blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'll sit right here. Bethany's in the little stroller, and I'm just sitting there and, and playing with her and having a big time. She must have been, I don't know, she's still just almost a, just a little baby. And I don't even know how much time went by. But Tracy was able to go maybe to some of the stores that she didn't want to drag me through and whatever. Now listen, we've raised three daughters. I've been drugged through every woman's store there is. <laughs> And then what they do is they leave and go to the next one with the stuff piled on the counter for me to pay for so I can follow them to the next one. I don't want to talk about it. But anyway, I, I'll never forget. I was just preoccupied with watching her. And this elderly lady walked over to me and said, young man? I said, yes, ma'am. I was probably in my late 20s then. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I want to compliment you. And I said, for what? She said, I've been watching you over there. And she said, there must have been 25 beautiful women walk past you since your wife walked away and you've not looked at even one of them. And I thought, to God be the glory, yeah. right? Yeah. Fix your eyes on him. It's when I take my eyes off of him and what his desire is in my life. I can, like anybody in this room, be in a really, really bad place. I went to seminary with guys I would have bet my mortgage would never fall morally. And y'all know that the standards that I set for myself, I, I hold myself to a very high standard. I won't counsel with other women by myself. I won't do it. And that's got me in trouble with women calling me crazy for being that way. But I've never gotten emotionally involved with a woman and run off of my, away from my wife either. I've had dear friends of mine that love the Lord with all their heart that drop their guard. And next thing you know, their ministry's shot. I don't want to be that guy. And so fix your eyes on the Lord. Number two, true servants fill their lives with the Word of God. If I've done anything, I hope I've preached that to you all these years. He 
He says, turn your eyes away from looking at vanity and listen to this, and revive me in your ways, he says. Wow. <laughs> revive me in your ways. He goes on to say this in verse 30, 38. Establish your word to your ser servant. The word establish there is yash yash yashad. It literally means this, to firmly place or to plant. Think about that. What a prayer that would be to say, God, would you plant your word in your servant? You'll find yourself sometimes in a place where you, you know, we have these phones now. Let's change that. There used to be a day you'd find yourself away from your Bible and need to share, your, share the gospel with somebody. Well, if you've not memorized some scripture, you can't do that, right? Hide God's word in your heart. He says here, treasure it. Listen, establish it. Plant it within me so that when the time comes, I'll have it right there. I love that we have all this technology and I love that we can pull up stuff on the phone. But there's something special about just pulling it out of your heart and letting it come out of your mouth. And that only happens when you establish it. So fill your life with the Word of God. You've never wasted one second that you spent reading God's Word. And we have no excuse today, my friends. Technology is everything. Every morning, the very first thing I do before I do, I mean, I literally wake up, leave my bedroom, and I turn it on, and I let the Bible read to me. And it reads to me for the next 20 or so minutes. And I just sit and listen. And so praise God for that. There's a lot of hard words in there that we can't pronounce real well, and that whoever does that really pronounces them really well for me, right? But, I mean, let that start your day. And then dig in. I have the privilege to come to work every day, and I get to spend all day studying the Word of God. I mean, what a joy that is. Fill your life with it. You'll never, ever regret doing that. Okay, we're servants. The third thing here is that you know, true servants faithfully honor their Savior. It says, establish your word to your servant. Listen to this. As that which produces reverence for you. That word reverence often uses the word fear. It's not, I'm afraid of you, God. It's that I'm in awe of you, God. Are you in awe of him? I mean, think about it. If he really is who the word says he is, we should be in awe of who he is. And so the more you're in the word of God, the more you're going to be in awe of who he is, the author of this very word, to just think about what he's done just for you. You don't have to think about what he's done for him. Just think about what he's just done for you in your life. I have all the reason I need for the remainder of a thousand lifetimes to be in awe of who he is. Because 100% of what he's done for me was completely undeserved. I couldn't earn it. I couldn't be good enough. I couldn't do anything. It was him. It wasn't me. It was him. It wasn't you. And so true servants faithfully, man, be be a person who quickly gives God the glory. I don't know how many times I get phone calls during the day. I got a phone call today, and we'll talk about Miss Peggy's been in the hospital. We got really good news today about what's going on with her, and she may be able to come home tomorrow. And she called me this afternoon. We're talking on the phone. And my instant reply, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. I hope we say that countless times every day. The sun came up this morning, to God be the glory. I made it through another day at the end of the day, to God be the glory, right? Um, my wife didn't leave me today. She didn't throw my stuff out in the yard today. To God be the glory, right? So we have all the reason in the world to faithfully make sure that we honor him. He deserves to be honored. Please uh, know that. And then fourthly and finally, the believer is to, is to be sanctified. Sanctified. He says in verse 39, Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. Some interesting things he says here. Write these down if you will. Number one, Lord, please make me good. It's an honorable prayer. Turn away my, my reproach, which I dread, for your ordinances are good. The word reproach there is a scorn or contempt. And what most likely it's a reference to is he's being criticized. Have you ever been criticized for being a Christian? If you've never been criticized for being a Christian, you're probably not living it loud enough before other people. Because I don't think you can go a day in this world without standing up for Christ and not getting criticized for it. And let me just tell you this. The line is long and distinguished of people who will criticize you for your faith. Um, being a Christian is not a popularity contest. It should not be. We don't go looking for I don't pray the first thing every morning. God, let there be a lot of people that hate my guts today. That's not what... It'll happen naturally. 
if you stand by the things of Christ. He's going through some stuff. This scorn and contempt for people that are uh, giving accusations to him and criticizing him for his faith. He said, and take that back to the text. He said, turn away my reproach. God, help that. I dread that. I can't stand it when people do that. Would you turn me away from that? And this, he says, for your ordinances are good. Turn me back to your word. You, when, when are we going to get to the place in this life where what God thinks matters more than what anybody else thinks? And I know I've told you this before. I say this to my wife occasionally. If every person on planet Earth thought that I was the greatest preacher, I'm not. Thought I was the greatest preacher that ever lived. I'm not even close to that. But if everybody thought that and my wife did not think that, I would think I would be a total failure. Because she knows me better than any other person on the planet. Not even close. Even my mother doesn't know me as well as my wife knows me. Her opinion matters more than the whole world combined to me. And maybe I'm wrong in that, but it's the way I feel. And so why shouldn't it matter more about what God thinks about you than what the whole world thinks about you? Let them criticize. I expect opposition when I stand up, stand up for the Lord. And here's someone going through that little thing. People are slinging stuff at him and saying horrible things. It would be the equivalent day somebody got on Instagram and talked bad about me or somebody got on Facebook or I posted something on Facebook and nobody commented on it or whatever it may be as though you're a failure for that. How about this? Why don't you get in God's word and find out what he thinks about you? You know what you're going to find out is despite who we are, he loves you. He's crazy about you. I never understood, you know, back in the day, we didn't have cell phones like we did today. You know, the cell phones replaced so many different items in our life, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. Nobody has a camera anymore unless they're really professionals because you got a pretty good one there right in your pocket. It plays music for you. It can, you can go on the internet and find anything you can with a laptop computer today. It does everything for you, right? Used to when you get around, I, I pastored for a minute. And I've pastored some churches with a lot of elderly people. I and mean, you get around them and boy, they say, oh, I was just down in Atlanta to see my grandchildren again. You know, I got a new one. Let me, let me get my wallet and show you the pictures. Boom, you know, the pictures. Now we don't do that. We pick up our phone and we go, let me show you the pictures, right? You know, if God had an iPhone, your picture's in there. He knows you far more than you know yourself. And he loves you anyway. Think about that. He loves you anyway. When he gets a chance, he just wants to pull somebody aside. Have you, have you considered, look at, look, at, look at my grandson. Look at my granddaughter. He loves you. You'll find out. 100% again that's not deserved it's because of how incredible his grace and his mercy is toward us and so Lord help me be good I want to be good and the only way I can do that is be closer to him and farther away from the things of this world number two Lord make me godly what an honorable prayer God I want to be godly he says behold I long for your precepts revive me through your righteousness He's not satisfied with just being good. He wants to be holy. We all ought to, ought to want to be holy because he's holy, right? We want to be more like him. I've been praying for a long time in my life, and I've got so much farther to go than probably y'all do. God, make me more like you. I want to be more like Jesus. I don't know how many more years he'll let me be on this planet, but I'm going to keep praying that prayer, God. But the last day I'm here, help me be more like you and less like this world, right? He knew that this could never happen in his own strength, and I know it can't happen in my strength, and you know it can't happen in your strength. It only comes by his righteousness and his mercy. And he says that. He says, behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. I don't want my righteousness. By the way, I don't want yours either. I want his righteousness, right? And so that word righteous is the word mercy. In, 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 not in Hebrew, but I guess in, uh, we read in, in um, Greek, it's the word kesed. It's a very common word. He says this in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I'm so thankful it doesn't say seek first your kingdom and your righteousness because that will be worthless. But if I seek his kingdom and his righteousness, I put myself in the place where I can be blessed. And so we've probably talked too long, but four things God gave me when I studied this. I think that if we took those four things and just spent some time in the next few weeks trying to employ those in our own lives, 
God, help me be a better student. Help me be a soldier. I want to be a good soldier. I know you do too. Help me be a servant. Uh, we, we talked a lot. I've had a, um, a conversation with someone today. You can almost tell, if ever, if ever y'all got to be a preacher for a, a minute, you can almost tell when you've struck a chord with people by the feedback you get, right? And most of it's very positive, but um, God touched a bunch of people on Sunday and only not by the response and the people who've called and the people who've come by to talk to me about that. If we banish the word volunteer, make that a bad word at church. Remember, volunteers do something because it's convenient for them to do it at that time. A servant serves regardless, right? So what if we became those servants we're supposed to be? And then finally, what if we continued the process of sanctification, which is a work of God, not a work of man, but don't you want to be more righteous tomorrow than you were today, more like Jesus tomorrow than you are today? And that's that process. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he says. That doesn't mean go work for your salvation. It says go do everything in your power that you have been saved to be more like him. And so we'll stop right there. And guess what? We get to meet again next week. And um, we'll get busy pressing on and through this. And so thank you for your patience. I've, I've missed you desperately. And Look forward to getting back in the routine again.